So in this video, we're going to be talking about unit five, nuclear physics, nuclear, kaboom. But honestly, the word nuclear comes from the term uh, nucleus. Oh, I forgot to do the test. The test. Ah, oh, it's writing now. Cool. So we're going to talk about nuclear physics, which is all about the nucleus or atomic physics, as we sometimes call it. And it's all about radiation, radioactivity. So that's what we'll mainly discuss. But again, as we've mentioned before, there has been a syllabus update and absolutely nothing has been changed in unit five. So if you're watching this from the 2020 early videos, that's absolutely fine. This updated version has almost nothing different with a very small difference that we'll discuss later on. Note again to ex course students and extended students, if you're a year nine pre-IG or a course student, if you see this sign, this section is not for you. In unit five, that's not really a lot per se, probably the alpha scattering experiment among a couple of minor details, but that's pretty much it. The rest is kind of relevant, even if it's extended. But however, just listen to it nonetheless, it'll definitely help you round out your information, your understanding of physics. So what are we discussing today? We are going to be talking about what an atom is, so a lot like chemistry. What are isotopes and what is radioactive decay? And there are different types of radioactive emissions, so alpha and beta and gamma and so on. We'll talk about decay equations, as in when a radioactive isotope emits an alpha particle or a beta particle or a gamma ray. What happens to the remainder of that substance that's decaying? We'll discuss how do we measure background radiation and how radioactivity decreases over time and other properties of decay, the process itself. This will open up a discussion about half-life. We'll also talk about the alpha scattering experiment, which was an experiment performed by Ernest Rutherford with a piece of gold foil and an alpha source that helped him prove the structure of an atom. And we'll also talk about how alpha and beta particles can deflect in electric and magnetic fields. So this is basically an application of Fleming's left-hand rule when it comes to the magnetic field and just standard positive and negative attraction repulsion nonsense. Finally, we'll talk about different types of applications of radioactivity, like what are some useful applications of radioactivity and the safety precautions that we have to be wary of and take whenever we deal with radioactive isotopes and substances. So let's get started right away. You're all familiar with this. An atom is the building block of matter. It consists of three subatomic particles called protons and neutrons and electrons. Protons and neutrons exist inside the nucleus of an atom. This is the, basically the core of that atom. And you have small orbiting electrons in different energy levels and different energy shells around the orbit, or around the nucleus. Protons have a relative charge of plus one, electrons have a relative charge of negative one, and neutrons are neutral. Although, please remember, neutrons are not actually neutral as in they have no charge. They're neutral because they have both positive and negative charge in equal amounts, which gives it a resultant charge of zero. There's nothing that's completely uncharged. It has to consist of both positive and negative charges this will be very relevant when we talk about beta decay in a bit. The mass of a proton is considered one U. The mass of a neutron is one U, so they're the same mass, whereas an electron is one over 2,000 U. So it's 2,000 times lighter than a proton or a neutron. U actually has a value, and this is beyond the scope of the curriculum, but I want you to know it nonetheless. The value of U which is short for unified atomic mass constant, is approximately 1.66 times 10 to the power of negative 27 kilograms. 1.66, 1.67. So it's a very tiny number. That's why we don't have to memorize it per se, because since protons and neutrons have the same mass, I just need to compare them. That's all. Electrons are virtually massless, but they do have mass. They do have mass. Good. An irregular neutral atom, however, the number of protons inside the nucleus is equal to the number of electrons in the outer shells. Next, let's talk about isotopes. Here's helium, four and two. What's this value number four? This is what we call the nucleon number. 
or the mass number, which is the number of, oh, I forgot an extra N here, number, or the mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. That's why it's called the nucleon number or mass number. Basically, the mass number represents the relative mass of an atom. This smaller value, too, is the proton number, sometimes known as the atomic number. It represents the number of protons in an atom. And this is what determines what type of element we're talking about here. So is it hydrogen? Is it helium? What not? And this is important to remember because there are things called isotopes of an atom. An isotope of an atom, because this is also an isotope, by the way, but this is a stable and very common isotope. Some isotopes of atoms have, obviously an isotope is an atom with the same number of protons because it's the same element, but a different number of neutrons. So because the number of neutrons is different, in this case, it has three neutrons. How did I find that out? Five minus two is three. The total mass number minus the proton number gives me three neutrons. This isotope, is considered an unstable isotope of helium. What's the problem with unstable isotopes? The problem with unstable isotopes is that an unstable nucleus always emits a piece of itself called radiation, so something that it has to toss out in order to become a stable nucleus. So again, the purpose of an isotope, or not the purpose, sorry. The radioactive decay is a process. I meant to say process. It's a process where an unstable nucleus emits a bit of itself, which we will then call radiation, to become a stable nucleus. You have three different forms of radiation, alpha and beta and gamma, which we will now discuss. However, before we do, let's just talk about the nucleus a tiny bit more. If you recall, back in unit one, when we talked about nuclear power stations, we said that atoms can go through two types of nuclear reactions, which we call nuclear fission. Fission means to break something. And nuclear fusion. Fusion means to join things together and make it bigger. Nuclear fission is a reaction where a large nucleus is broken into smaller nuclei. For example, uh, this is a formula that you do not have to remember. But if you have a piece of uranium, for example, and you smash a neutron into the nucleus of that uranium, you break it apart into pieces. According to this example, it breaks up into two different isotopes that I don't know. Like you shouldn't memorize these elements anyway. And a bunch of free moving neutrons. Do you this kind of starts a chain reaction and breaks other uranium nuclei inside, causing all of it to break down. But that's nuclear fusion. Large nucleus, broken into smaller nuclei. This releases energy. Nuclear fusion also releases energy, but this only happens in the sun, for now at least. There's a ton of research these days, and they've been recently very successful at maintaining ignition and maintaining a nuclear fusion reaction lately, which is awesome, by the way, but we can talk about that in the future. Why? Because nuclear fusion is two smaller nuclei that are joined to form one larger nucleus. Two small atoms, smack them together, they make a big atom. For example, we take two hydrogen atoms or two hydrogen isotopes joined together to form helium. You've got the leftover neutrons, so it doesn't really matter. So you join them together, they make a bigger atom. That's fusion. Now, some isotopes we discussed earlier are naturally existing or that you know result from different nuclear reactions. So for example, hydrogen two and hydrogen three, these are naturally occurring isotopes. Some of these are as well, but these were released after nuclear fission. So some of these isotopes emit radiation. And we said there are three types of radiation that could be emitted from an unstable nucleus. We call them alpha particles. Here's the symbol for alpha. Beta particles, here's the symbol for beta. Gamma rays, here's the symbol for gamma. And we've already seen gamma rays before. But let's just talk about them. What's an alpha particle? 
An alpha particle is when the nucleus emits two protons and two neutrons. So a nucleus of an atom loses two protons and two neutrons, shoves them together into a little tightly packed you know, ball and tosses it out. That's called an alpha particle. It has a mass of 4u and a charge of plus 2, because 2 plus 2 is 4, and a positive 2 charge. And if I were to write a notation for it, like an element, it has a mass number of 4 and a proton number of 2. OK. The second type of radioactive emission that was discovered is called a beta particle. And it consists of one electron. Like if I ask you, can you describe the nature of an alpha particle or a beta particle? I mean, what is that substance made of? So the nature of a beta particle is one electron from the nucleus of the atom. You might be thinking, how the heck do we get an electron from a nucleus? We just said that nucleus of an atom Let's go back. Consists of protons and neutrons. Alas, if you recall, we said that neutrons are neutral because they consist of both positive and negative charges in equal amounts. So when radioactive decay occurs and you emit a beta particle, a beta particle or an electron is emitted from the nucleus, but it's emitted from the neutrons inside the nucleus, meaning one neutron breaks into a proton and an electron because neutrons are actually made up of protons and electrons. Oop, they break. The proton is left behind, but the electron flies away. And we call this a beta particle. So it's basically an electron, but from the nucleus. Same mass as an electron, same charge as an electron, but its notation is zero and negative one because zero has no mass number, obviously. Negative one is arguable because the number down there should have been the proton number. Remember the hydrate, folks? Should have been the proton number, but you know what? It's negatively charged, so we give it a negative sign, and there's another reason for it, which we'll discuss in the equations in a bit. Gamma rays are just waves. It's just a bunch of energy. It's an electromagnetic wave, which means it can travel through vacuums. It travels straight lines. It's a transverse wave. It travels very fast at 3 times 10 power 8 meters per second. It has no mass, has no charge. It's absolutely, no. It's not a particle. It's just a wave. So these are the three types of radioactive emissions that are emitted when an unstable isotope decays, goes through the process of decay. Very nice. So then what's the difference between them? There are two things you have to keep in mind. Actually, three, but two things you have to keep in mind. How strong are they in terms of ionization? And how strong or good are they at penetration? Now, you might be wondering, I know what penetrate means, means to go through things, but what does ionization mean? To ionize something, if you remember in chemistry, an ion is simply a positive or a negative charge. So to ionize something means to make it charged. And the way you make an atom charged is by either removing electrons from the orbit, so now that atom is positively charged, it's a positive ion, or you add extra electrons to it, which makes it a negatively charged ion. Radiation literally smacks through the electrons in its way. So uh, I often like to, <laughs> I hate this, I hate this reference, but it does make sense. Think of this like a wrecking ball, like Miley Cyrus's wrecking ball. I came in like a wrecking ball. If you remember that song, I hope this doesn't get demonetized. Anyway, uh, I already am. I forgot about that. <laughs> So, as an alpha particle smacks through the electrons of the atoms in the way, it just removes the electrons. Like a couple of bowling pins just flying off. So, it ionizes the air itself as it goes through it. So what? So what if something is ionized? Like, so what if air is ionized? Well, nothing special. It'll just conduct electricity better. If non-living things or objects are ionized, they just get charged. 
if living tissue gets ionized, like if your cells get ionized, if your body gets ionized, what happens? Well, you, your cells either die, to be honest, or your cells start to mutate. And basically it turns into cancer cells. And that's a bad idea. Bad idea. So how strong is alpha in terms of ionization? It's extremely strong. It's very strong. It's the most strongly ionizing. Beta is just strongly ionizing. Gamma is very weak, mainly because alpha has a lot of mass and a lot of charge, whereas gamma rays have no mass and no charge. So it's very weak. What about their penetration? Alpha particles can travel only up to 5 to 10 centimeters in air before they're absorbed. Beta particles can only travel up to 10 meters in air before they're absorbed. And gamma rays don't really have a range. They travel several kilometers, far distance. To stop alpha or beta or gamma, there is the minimum, there's a minimum amount of material that you need to stop them. If I just get a sheet of paper and I put it in front of a source that's emitting alpha particles, alpha particles can't even go through paper. They just stop. Whereas beta particles can go through paper. They don't care. To stop beta particles, I can't just use paper. So what we have to use is aluminum. It's not a very dense metal, but you know what? A few sheets of aluminum would be fine. Gamma, on the other hand, because it's a wave and not a particle, doesn't care about anything. In order to stop gamma, you need a thick sheet of lead. But even then, some gamma still leaks through. And you know what? That's okay. If whatever leaks through is very weak anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right? So you have to memorize the differences between all three in terms of ionization and penetration. I have a question here. How is gamma the strongest? How is alpha the strongest? Gamma is the weakest. In terms of ionization, to ionize means to remove electrons from, an, from a bunch of atoms. Alpha is very strong because it removes a lot of electrons, whereas gamma is very weak because it does not remove a lot of electrons. So in terms of their danger or hazard or effect, alpha has this extremely strong effect because each alpha particle is big and heavy and with a lot of charge, whereas a gamma ray is a wave. It doesn't ionize very well. Good. Let's talk about their decay equations. Remember, and let me go back a couple of pages, alpha particles and beta particles specifically have a mass and proton number. You must memorize, you must memorize the mass and proton numbers of alpha and beta. You have to. Now, when it comes to any decay equation, any decay equation at all, there's one rule you have to follow. The total mass and proton number before a decay equation is equal to the total mass and proton number after. So if the total here is 13 in the mass number and six in the proton number. What's the mass and proton number of alpha again? Stuff you're supposed to memorize. So four and two. 13 minus four gives you nine. Six minus two gives you four. In other words, that's the only thing you need to do. You have to memorize what the values of alpha and beta, therefore, are. And you can continue the equation at your leisure. So 13 minus 4 gives you 9, so that this sum is still 13. 4 plus 2 is 6. The sum is still 6. If you give this a shot with any other formula, well, if you already know and this is alpha, so 234 minus 4 is 231. 92 minus 2 is 90. Beta decay, that's zero and negative one. Remember that, zero and negative one. I'll, I'll talk about the nuance in a bit. So 14 minus zero gives you 14 because you know what? When a beta particle is emitted, it does not change the mass number. So the mass number stays the same. But the proton number increases by one. And if you remember why, it's because we said a neutron changes into a proton and an electron. So basically, you lose a neutron and you gain a proton. So the number of protons increases by one inside that atom. Obviously, the electron is the beta particle, so it doesn't need to be included here. 
All right. Let's talk about background radiation. You're sitting at home, in bed, or on your desk, or anywhere else that you're like, using, or wherever by you're sitting, whatever device you're using to watch this video right now or to attend the session with me right now. If you have a radiation detector with you right now in that instant, assuming we can have it on an app later on or something, but we do need a sensor inside to measure stuff. And I turn on the device. This is called a Geiger-Muller tube, a GM tube. The function of a GM tube is to measure radiation. How does it do that? When radiation goes into its tube, it ionizes the air inside. Every time it ionizes, it creates sparks. All that this counter or thing does is to count the number of sparks that have been produced inside the tube due to what? Ionization. So the more radiation goes in, the more it gets ionized, and the more it gets ionized, the higher the reading on the count rate. So the units here are either counts per second or counts per minute. It just gives you the number of ionizations that occur per second. Wow, I was parched. So anyway, so if you turn on that radiation detector right now, wherever you're sitting, it will still give you a reading. There's no radioactive source next to you. It will still give you a reading. Why? Because that's called background radiation. Radiation from other stars, which we call cosmic rays, rocks underground and the very buildings you're sitting in because they were built using rocks and clay and stone from the ground. There are certain types of isotopes in the air that we're breathing. Radon is a gas that's radioactive. Your food and your drinks are radioactive. Hospitals emit a lot of radiation. Nuclear power stations produce a lot of radiation. You know what? All of these sources of background radiation are very weak, extremely weak. Just to give you a sense of scale, if you have an isotope, for example, that's emitting, I don't know, 16,000 counts per second, the background radiation is going to be around 20 counts per second. So this is nothing. Like the background, which is due to the surroundings, is almost nothing. But keep in mind, if I ever tell you that, hey, here's a source of radiation, and here's a detector. Here's the source of radiation. Here's a detector. And that detector measures... 120 counts per second. And I tell you that the background radiation is 20 counts per second. What's the actual radiation coming from that source? Like how much is actually being emitted by the source? Because detectors are stupid. They just measure everything that goes into them. So if you're only looking for the source value, it'll be 120 minus 20, which gives you 100 counts. So keep in mind that most of the time, if I'm giving you a detector reading, it must be corrected for background, meaning you have to remove background from the reading in order to see the actual radiation emitted by a certain source. All right. So you've got a detector at home. You're measuring the radiation. And then you realize, oops, it's a bit higher than background. It's a lot higher than background radiation. Why? Because I don't know, uh, your room is very radioactive for some reason. Somebody embedded some uranium all around your room because they want to, you know, murder you softly and quietly. With the, uh, anyway, grim, gr grim images aside. Grim images aside. Don't be too scared. You're scared. Don't be too scared. Come on. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? Right? You'll just get a bit ionized, you know? You'll be charged up, you know? Cancer is a side effect, but you'll be charged up. Who doesn't want to be charged up and ready, full of energy? Anyway, jokes aside. If you turn on that detector and you measure a reading that's very high, which means there is a radioactive source next to you, you will realize that that reading decreases over time. It's not constant. It always decreases over time, which makes sense. 
because the more a substance decays, the more stable it becomes. So when an unstable isotope decays, let's say this portion of it has decayed, this is now stable, whereas this is unstable. So the total amount of radiation it could give out has decreased. Total amount of radiation it can give out has decreased. So the more stable an isotope becomes, the less radiation it gives out. That's the first observation. Second, decay is random. What do I mean by random? I mean, this is the reason why there are fluctuations in the reading. If you take a look at the GM tube or the meters, needle, for example, if the needle starts zero here and gives me an average value of 1,000, for example, it will never actually give me a proper value of 1,000. The needle is actually going to fluctuate a bit and change all the time within the same few seconds because the amount of radiation given out at any moment on average decreases, but at any moment is random. You don't know exactly how many atoms are decaying at any moment. That's why there are a few spikes up and down on this graph. All right. Decay is a spontaneous process. Spontaneous simply means it's unaffected by external factors. So heat it, cool it, sit on it, run an electric current through it, dunk it in some water. Absolutely nothing happens to how fast it will decay or how slow something decay or even it won't allow you to stop radioactive decay completely. It's uncontrollable. It's one of those few things in nature that you really cannot control on your own. It's spontaneous. Nothing affects it. Good. However, we did say that radioactivity decreases over time, and we realized that any isotope in the world has a very similar pattern in its decay process with some varying values, but it's almost the same. And that introduces the concept of half-life to us. Uh, half-life three, anyone? Hey gang, anybody wants half-life three? No, just me? Okay. So what is half-life? It's the time taken for the number of unstable nuclei or for the radiation emitted or whatever to decrease by half. Take a look at this diagram. You've got one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. Four times five is what? 20. If you wait for, for example, one hour, you will only have ten atoms left. You're like, okay, cool. That's okay. It's decaying. It's emitting radiation. It's now 10 atoms left in this radioactive isotope. If you wait for another hour, you will only have five. If you wait for another hour, you'll only have 2.5. In other words, half-life, this time, it's not just from random time, it's the time taken for half of the substance to become stable or decay. All right? So how do you use half-life? Like, and what is the value of half-life? You're, you're not going to memorize any half-life, by the way. You're not memorizing the half-life of uranium, of carbon, of any substance. You are not. But you should know how to use the concept of half-life. So let's solve a quick example. Here's a graph. And I'm simply going to ask you to find the half-life of this radioactive source from the graph. So how do we start? If my starting value is 2,000 counts per second, that's your starting value. Half of that is 1,000. So you head to the 1,000, like you get the first value. Look for half of that and then one. You hit the graph, go back down, and you've now gotten. 
which is how much time it takes for the radioactivity to decrease by half. Do you have any questions about half-life so far? Okay, good, nothing. Here's another example, but not a graph-related example. It says a sample of a radioactive substance has an activity of 240 counts per second. The half-life is three years. So the half-life here was given. Calculate the activity after 12 years. So here's the long way, guys. Let me show you the long way. If you start off at 240, after three years, what will you have left? Half. So that's 120. After three years, what will be left? That's half of this. 60. After three more years, that's a total of nine years. What's half of 60? 30. After three more years, what's half of 30? 15. We've reached our end goal. All right. So the activity of the sample is 15 counts per second. Very nice. Now, this next bit is for extended students, but then we'll go back to some core topics, like uh, examples of radioactivity and what we use them for. But the alpha scattering experiment is a very simple experiment. We got a gold foil, a very, very, very thin gold foil, and we basically shown a ray or a beam of alpha particles onto the gold foil. It's just a piece of gold, a very thin piece of gold, thinner than paper too, by the way. When the alpha paper, alpha particles, sorry, hit that foil, three things happened, three observations occurred. Observation number one, most of the atoms go through undeflected without change of direction. Observation number two, Some alpha particles were deflected. And observation number three, this is the most important one, a very, very small portion of alpha particles were reflected backwards, or we like to say deflected in angles greater than 90. That's observation number three. So what do they prove? First, it proves that the atom is mostly empty space. So if you have an atom like this, and another atom here, and another atom here, and another atom here, it's mostly empty in between the nuclei and the electrons. And the electrons are virtually worthless at the moment. Like They don't really affect anything. Second, it proves that the nucleus is a concentration of mass and positive charge, meaning that the alpha particle is positive, and the nucleus has to be positive because any alpha particle that, that goes near a nucleus, right? What will it do? Will it be repelled or attracted? Since alpha particles are positive and this nucleus is also positive, right? It deflects downwards. Any alpha particles that just pass through, they pass through because they're in between nuclei then alpha particles that hit directly nucleus get deflected backwards, which proves that the size of the nucleus is very small because the number of alpha particles that do reflect backwards, if you remember the previous diagram, were very small, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. So observation number one, atom is mostly empty space. Observation number two, there is a nucleus with a lot of mass and positive charge. Observation number three, the size of this nucleus is very small relative to the rest of the atom. Next. Deflection is a very simple concept. You move some next to something charged and it changes your direction. So if I put two pieces of metal, metal plates here, Alpha particles will be attracted towards what? The negative. Beta particles will be attracted towards what? The positive, because it's negative. So that's why. 
But what about the magnetic field? This is where good old Fleming's left-hand rule starts. If you have a beam here that consists of alpha and beta and gamma, all three, if I apply Fleming's left-hand rule here, this is your magnetic field. This should always point towards the board. Right. This is what? Your current. Now you might say, mister, there is no current. Where is the current? Any flow of charges like an alpha particle constitutes a current. So because an alpha particle is positively charged, as it moves, as it moves, it behaves like a current, especially if you have a bunch of alpha particles moving together. So they do act like a current. And finally, this is the force. So if an alpha particle goes through and I'm pointing towards the board, middle finger of my current's moving to the right, the force is upwards, alpha particles move up, and beta particles will obviously deflect downwards. On the flip side, gamma doesn't change ever. It's not even a particle, so it has no mass and it has no charge and it's not affected by any electric or magnetic field. But one final observation. Why do you think Beta particles change direction so harshly, but alpha particles took their time when they were deflecting. It's a very simple answer, by the way. Because I'll thank you exactly mass. Because alpha particles have a lot of mass. They're much heavier than, they're 8,000 times heavier than a beta particle. Right? That's why the alpha doesn't deflect much. It's too heavy. Let's finish up this section and the unit by talking about a few applications and safety precautions. You have tons of applications like smoke detectors. Smoke detectors have a radioactive isotope inside and a sensor. As long as there is radiation moving from the isotope to the center, no problem. But if smoke gets in the way, this stops the radiation from going through to the center. So the sensor rings. That's how smoke detectors work. Sterilizing medical equipment. That, that's easy. You know, all these scaffolds and you know blades and stuff like that. Not all of them can be thrown away, obviously. Right? It's a waste. But what they do is put it in a device that looks like a microwave oven. Right? Now, but it looks like a microwave oven, but it doesn't expose it to microwaves. It, it releases radiation. Alpha and beta and gamma, probably beta and gamma, honestly. It's mostly beta and gamma. So if you have any living organisms, bacteria, viruses, any kind of harmful pathogens, these all get killed off by putting them in that microwave-like device that is actually not emitting microwaves, it's emitting radiation. Irradiating food. Food that's made in cans and stuff like that is always exposed to a little bit of radiation. Again, again, there's a difference between getting exposed to radiation and putting a radioactive substance in the food. You don't do that. We do not do that. We just shine radiation through the food, which makes it charred. But if there's any living organism in that food, especially canned foods, by the way, in that food, then what does it do? Well, it just kills the pathogens. It makes your food safe to eat. You can use it to treat cancer using gamma radiation, so radiotherapy. You can use it to check for broken underground pipes or the measurement of paper or aluminum foil in a factory. So this one is, for example, how do you use aluminum and, sorry, use radiation to help you roll out aluminum into thinner sheets? Wow. When you push the aluminum through two rotating rollers, they squish the metal, making it thinner and longer. But how do I measure the thickness while it's being squished? I, I can't just stop the machine, sit down, pull out a micrometer, measure the thickness, tell the machine to work again, then stop it again every time I want to check a reading. So what they do is they put a source of radiation on one side, doesn't have to be at the top, could be at the bottom and a detector on the other side.
then if the thickness of this sheet is too thick, if the thickness of the sheet is too thick, there will be less radiation that reaches the detector. So your machines know that the sheet is too thick. They need to correct for it. If the reading is too low, that's because what I wanted to say reading. Because the reading is too low, this means that the thickness of the sheet is way too big and we need to make it small. The thickness, oh. and if the reading is too high, this means the sheet is really thin. It's too thin. You should make it thick. So that's one application. There are tons of other applications, but as you saw past papers, you're going to see them all and get them figured out. How do I protect myself from radiation? Well, easy. If you're storing it, use lead boxes. Uh, close the boxes with locks. Put the boxes in cupboards and then close the lock the cupboards. So you have lots of precautions to stop students, for example, in a lab from using these radioactive isotopes. Second, this is a very common one. You reduce exposure time. If you're actually working with nuclear materials and actual nuclear substance, well, don't be exposed to it for too long. And when I say too long, I mean like for a few hours or a few minutes. Just a few seconds is enough. Second, increase the distance between the source and the living tissue. That's fine. If you stay away from the source, you're absolutely safe. Use a shield, <laughs> mainly lead. Let's be real. It's a lead wall or lead line material. That will completely stop almost all types of radiation. So, any questions about Unit 5 before I end the session here? Very good. See you guys next time.